Well, welcome everybody. Uh, on behalf of uh, Alex, who's the main organizer of the group, but also uh, Stefan uh, and, and I, we are really happy to introduce you to this session of the fourth Price of Money um, discussion group, which meets every uh, Saturday or almost every Saturday at this, at this time. And we've, uh, last week, uh, we had a very intense discussion on the German hyperinflation. We discussed um, uh, Karl Ludwig Holfrey's book, The German Hyperinflation 19, I forget the name, the, the exact. 14. Years, 14, yeah, of course, World War I uh, until 24, 23, 24. Um, um, I'll, I'll get that right in a second, but I want to briefly, he's now joining us today uh, and we're recording this for those of you watching later. Uh, th for me, this is very personal because uh, as, as you might know, um, I wrote my master thesis on the period afterwards, which is on 1933 through 37 on Hamaschacht and the German recovery. But it's even personal on the level of Karl Ludwig Holferich was a professor uh, um, at the Free University at the John F. Kane Institute where I studied myself. Uh, I didn't take a course of his directly, but uh, I took courses that he previously taught uh, by Moritz Schulerich and others. Uh, uh, by, uh, and so for me, it's sort of a little bit of a homecoming. And I remember that you, you, you came to the very last thing I did in Berlin before I joined my, I joined INET in 2012, which was uh, the poor Kennedy's performance that we had at the Kennedy Institute. So that, that if you might remember, you came to visit that, that performance in 2012 as well. It was a theater performance by, by, by the poor Kennedys at the time. So that, that's just the introduction and it's really great to have you here. We're really excited. I think we wanna go, go right into the discussion. So for those of you who are watching later, we already had a discussion last week. I mentioned it earlier already, but previously we also read uh, Kindleberger's account and Kindleberger basically uh, talks about three different interpretations or three different viewpoints that uh, might all be true. That's also what he's saying, but there is a monetarist account. There's a balance of payments account and there's a structuralist account that Kindleberger uh, was bringing forward in interpreting the German hyperinflation. But what I also liked about the, 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 the approach that Kindleberger uh, did in his own book was to also try to put the, the inflation into different episodes, starting with uh, the war itself. Um, and um, in the war, of course, we had war debts, we had price controls, we had taxation policies uh, and so forth but then also the adjustments from the war economy into peace economy with the adding of reparations, adding to the existing stock of debt. Um, you have a huge domestic, um, uh, domestic turmoil, of course, because uh, we have the, uh, a sort of revolution in Germany. We have the, the founding of the Weimar Republic and different constituencies buying or not buying into that Republic as such. And that has, I think, a, a large part of the story at least the one, the structuralist story that Kindleberger had, which was the different factions were uh, were interested or not interested in, 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 in Germany's ability to pay the reparations, for instance, and any kinds of payment. Um, and then we, of course, the, in, the, in the later stages, we see uh, this sort of intense situation in the Rhineland, which leads to the French occupation of the Rhineland. So those are, there's a lot of episodes and details but I think for us, what we want to maybe get at to, uh, today, in my, in my view, but this is an open conversation, would be to sort of look at uh, weighing what, what are different drivers in inflation, what are the different stages, uh, what is timing, and how do we weigh these different perspectives, monetarist versus balance of payments versus structuralist, uh, against each other. Because I think one conclusion we had last week was that it was very difficult for us to point at anything uh, in particular, that was a clear sort of a clear cut driver to the, the inflation, but maybe uh, in addition also, what did the Reichsbank think itself? What was the position of the Reichsbank in, 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 in the German treasury? So we have, we are pointing at various, various different elements and uh, in, in a certain parlance, it's a big hot mess and it's very difficult to really understand what is exactly the main driver, if there's any. So maybe before we get into any of, the, of these particularities, um, 
I would like to just offer also Karl Ludwig the, the opportunity to sort of reflect on the book in general, like it's, it was published in 1986 in a certain context with a sort of a debate that was happening at the time. Maybe you can reflect on what the book meant at the time and how you see the book now. And then we can get started about talking about the inflation itself and the different episodes with a minute of inflation. So let's start with that. Thank you. Okay. Um, for one thing, the book wasn't published in 1986. That was the English translation. Actually, the book was uh, published in 1980 in German, the original. And uh, I worked on it in the 1970s. And if you recall the 1970s, it was the period of stagflation, if you remember. Um, the inflation issue was a big thing at the time. And um, well, today, evidently in the US, even more than here in Germany, uh, inflation is uh, a big uh, worry again in the public. And um, uh, well, at the time I wanted uh, to um, to give an explanation um, to what has constituted supposedly a German trauma uh, in uh, German monetary history after the hyperinflation. And um, uh, at first I did not myself know the causes and, and consequences, especially in terms of um, redistribution of income and wealth. Um, and I got a surprising result, which uh, had not been um, uh, found previously, namely that uh, the income distribution was more equal after hyperinflation than before the First World War in Germany. Uh, and the causes for that I have treated um, in my book. Um, but um, it wasn't as simple as Milton Friedman would make us believe that, you know, uh, inflation is always a monetary phenomenon. And when uh, the Rice Bank at the time, Germany's central bank, increases the money supply, it automatically um, leads uh, to inflation. Uh, the balance of payments theory, on the other hand, uh, was more or less an excuse, a pretext, a nonsense to be able to put the blame on the allies and their reparation demands. Uh, the structuralist approach of Kindleberger, I think, um, has holds more water than the other two. And um, it, in essence, it is also a Keynesian view, uh, uh, namely that uh, costs are driving prices, um, full employment is a necessity to uh, start a big inflationary process. If you have a lot of underemployment as in the Great Depression, it is hard to uh, create an inflationary environment. Um, Hitler, when he started, Jay, you must know that, when he started together with Schacht, uh, his expansionary program, um, he called on Wilhelm Lautenbach. I don't know whether you know that name. He was a, a public official in the economics ministry uh, here in Berlin, and he was an expert for um, currency questions. And Hitler asked him, Herr Lautenbach, uh, I am being told that our policy here in 1933 with the um, 
uh, expansion through money creation at the central bank uh, will create inflation. And Lautenbach uh, has answered, uh, uh, you, Herr Hitler, are now the most powerful man in Germany, but even you are unable to create an inflation under the present circumstances, meaning um, underemployment and, and the lack, uh, well, plenty of uh, uh, potential output uh, capacity in, in the economy. Uh, only when <clears throat> full employment was reached in the, by the end of 1936, did Schacht and the, and the uh, Rice Bank become worried about inflationary pressure. And that is correct. As long as you have underutilized uh, production potential, it is difficult to create an inflation. Now, um, I read this week in the newspapers that <clears throat> the um, uh, boom of the American economy has slowed somewhat, which uh, for investors was a sign that uh, the uh, easy money policy would not be ended. So uh, there was a boom at the stock market uh, these past days. Um, because it was expected that interest rates would remain low. Um, I first go through some uh, explanations for the inflation during the First World War. When the war started in August 1914, all sides expected that it would be over by Christmas. Um, the, the French, as well as the British and uh, Germans. And in the case of uh, Russia, it was over by Christmas. But in the case of the Western powers, it was not. Um, now, German uh, public finance theory, uh, which held a different position on public debt than the British classical economists in the first half of the 19th century, German public financial theorists in the second half uh, were much more in favor of public debt especially when it came to financing public investment, but also uh, financing a war. Uh, because this was an extraordinary event which uh, would harm the economy if it would be financed only by tax increases. So the German government expecting that the war would be over soon uh, did go into public debt uh, practically 100% during the First World War. But since it lasted not six months, but uh, four years, um, a, a huge public debt was accumulated and the inflationary consequences of it were hidden by price controls and rationing. Now, the consequence was that um, people accumulated huge amounts of cash, which they couldn't spend during the First World War. And when the war came to an end and um, uh, prices in, we go into that later, uh, price controls and especially uh, exchange rate controls 
were abandoned, um, this uh, purchasing power went into operation and pushed prices up. Uh, so we have a first uh, big phase of inflation, visible inflation this time, not hidden inflation like during the war, uh, until about uh, January 1920. Um, but then for about a year and a half until uh, May, June 1921, uh, the price development stabilized. It was fluctuating, uh, but in the trend was stable. There was no inflation in that period on average. Uh, and what was the expla explanation for that? Uh, the explanation was that uh, foreign capital investors uh, thought that with the huge depreciation of the mark um, and with um, prices in Germany rising much less than the mark was falling on the exchange rates, thought that the mark uh, exchange rate had to recover instead of falling further down. So they wanted to profit from the exchange rate recovery of the mark. And um, that was, of course, not long-term capital, but short-term capital that flowed into the German economy. Um, people opened up mark accounts with German banks on the side of Americans on a big scale and the British also, the Dutch and uh, all people in stable currencies. Even more so as uh, there was full employment in Germany while the world economy uh, was suffering from the first depression, 1920-1921. And uh, investors thought, well, if the German economy is performing so well, and they could feel it also in terms of uh, German export products in their own countries on the markets, um, it must recover. Um, the uh, the threat of a hyperinflation was uh, not uh, seen by those investors. In any case, uh, the capital inflow stabilized the exchange rate in that period. And um, all the while, the money supply namely financing public expenditure through the Rice Bank printing press uh, continued. So there was a huge expansion of the money supply in that period also, but it didn't uh, transform itself into inflationary uh, trends. What stopped this uh, period was uh, again, reparations, the London ultimatum of 1921, which uh, was finally signed by German politicians against a lot of resistance. And, um, and that changed expectations as to uh, the stability of the German marks somewhat. Um, so, there was an inflationary performance after May 1921, but it wasn't yet hyperinflation. There was still capital flowing in because the exchange rate always outpaced uh, the inflation, the domestic inflation in Germany itself. And then people realized especially the French realized 
who were interested in reparations from Germany, that to enable Germany to pay reparations, uh, capital imports had to take place and they wanted to put it on a solid long-term basis and a Morgan committee was um, uh, employed by the by the reparation commission in um, June 1921 and they came and said yes we can mobilize American capital to flow into Germany um, JP Morgan and other bankers from the states but under certain conditions and one condition was to scale down reparations the reparation debt on Germany and the French refused. And, um, and then the Morgan committee said, no, then we can't do anything for you. And that was the turning point towards hyperinflation. All expectations now um, um, went um, into expecting hyperinflation. And hyperinflation means more than 50% price increase per month. If you can imagine what that is per year, it's uh, several thousand uh, percent per year. In any case, uh, the currency, the German currency was doomed, but it still exerted one uh, effect which had created um, all throughout that early world depression, a booming German economy and full employment in Germany. And this was the development of German exports. Um, Germany was, despite all the protectionism that had been created, in the United States already uh, when the Republicans took the White House again in 1921. Uh, in Britain, um, in France especially as part of the Versailles Treaty also, <clears throat> the only way for Germany to overcome uh, the barriers to German exports abroad was the exchange rate. Actually, this was what prompted economics minister Robert Schmidt um, to uh, stop controlling the exchange rate in the summer of 1920, uh, in the summer of 1919, excuse me. Um, and, and that, after that first inflationary period, due to the overhang of cash in Germany, the second inflationary period in 1919, second half of 1919, followed uh, because the exchange rate was going down the drain and, um, and the domestic prices uh, kept adjusting to the fall of the exchange rates, but always, always with a lag. So there was a competitive advantage for German exports in world markets. Otherwise, Germany would never have so quickly regained former markets abroad. And this was the key to full employment. Let me make a stop here. Uh, so yeah, so um, I have a question. Um, I like in your book how you uh, try to distinguish between the um, kind of proximate economic causes or economic determiners of the inflation versus the ultimate um, kind of political determiners. So I guess a question, um, a question I want to ask is, is it then true that maybe uh, in some sense proximately uh, inflation is 
uh, always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, but then you have to kind of go deeper and see, well, what are the constraints that are causing these monetary conditions? What are, what are the political constraints, that kind of stuff? Is that how you would describe it? Uh, yes, that's uh, quite well expressed. Um, the proximate cause is um, actually an increase in the money supply. But as I said, you can have an increase, even a large increase in the money supply, and it doesn't show up in the inflation rate. If, for instance, you have capital imports that compensate for the inflationary effects. Um, Friedman's theory uh, addresses the proximate cause. Uh, and um, behind it, the remote cause, um, it was the financing of the government budget through money creation at the Reichsbank. And the president of the Reichsbank, Hafenstein was his name, um, in secret uh, letters and reports to the government, always argued you must stop uh, the financing of public expenditure by going into debt at the Rice Bank. Otherwise, uh, this will be inflationary. And um, that was during the war? No, no, this was after, after the war. After, okay. Not during the war. During the war, he was quite willing to finance any expenditure the government wanted to make for the war uh, to win. Uh, no, this was after the war. And um, so at the Rice Bank, they knew that short, sooner or later, uh, the increase in the money supply would transform itself into inflation. Um, and some people argue like uh, Jared Feldman uh, one could maybe have used uh, the a period from early 1920 to May 1922 to stabilize the German currency. But this, and actually there were efforts to do it, the um, tax reform by Erzberger was uh, such uh, an attempt um, uh, well, the Reich uh, placed itself into collecting much more taxes, uh, theoretically, um, at the expense of the lender of the states. Uh, but uh, when it was to be applied, the inflationary tendency after May 1921 had already uh, set in and, you know, uh, income tax and corporation tax assessment was a very slow process. And when the taxes had to be declared, uh, it took uh, maybe a quarter or half a year uh, to, by, by the tax authorities, to uh, fix uh, the tax debt. And by that time, the amount, the real amount uh, being paid by corporations and individuals was tiny. So it never really worked. Um, but there was an effort to do that. So maybe there's a, a couple issues with the quantity theory. One is that it's, it's just approximate explanation, right? Uh, and then right. the other one is that um, you know, the money stock itself uh, might not be the direct uh, mechanism by which uh, money is related to inflation. So you have this kind of kind of flow of spending and flow of goods, and that's what determines the prices. But that's the, the connection between that and the money stock is not as direct, maybe as as Milton Friedman would um, want you to believe or something like that. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Now, um, you must know that um, um, capital inflow, be it short term, like during the inflation period, or long term, after the inflation period, during the 
the rest of the 1920s, uh, always produces import surpluses. Actually, uh, the balance of the current account is equivalent to the balance of the capital account, one with a plus and the other one with a minus. Right. So it's exactly equal. Um, now, when you have capital inflows, it means the products available for sale domestically are more than without capital imports. So this uh, can also help to keep inflationary tendencies down, except um, besides keeping uh, the exchange rate up, uh, capital inflows do that. So um, that's also an explanation of the long stability period, which was the period where most of the short-term capital entered Germany. And you had full employment, nevertheless, despite huge import surpluses, because uh, it was uh, the financing of government expenditure uh, was a work creation program, more or less, you know, <laughs> and uh, that kept it going. And uh, Actually, uh, industrial production was not yet recovering to the pre-war level, but it was uh, going up sharply during the Great Inflation. Now, would you, would you, I think earlier you said that um, in order to have inflation, you really have to kind of be um, at full employment, maxing out your economy's resources, uh, that kind of thing. Do mm -hmm. you feel that um, during the stagflation in the 1970s that we were fully employing our resources, but there was it was kind of a supply shock that was the issue? Or um, how do you reconcile the fact that the economy was growing more slowly with the fact that there was also inflation? Yeah, that's a difficult question. <laughs> and, um, um, and I would say... Um, that I never worked on that question, but I would say that here the structural explanation of Kittelberger is uh, quite appropriate because um, at least in Germany, uh, the 1970s, uh, when the inflation rate picked up uh, was a time when uh, uh, wages exploded. Um, it was a time of um, the government had just turned to Willy Brandt in 1969, I believe it was, and then the left-wing people of the SPD and, and the labor unions uh, proclaimed that they would test uh, what uh, the economy could bear in terms of higher wages. And actually they pushed uh, the wage rate up tremendously in the early 1970s. And uh, this seems to have contributed uh, to uh, stagflation. Uh, there was when Helmut Schmidt took over the chancellorship, I believe it was in 1974, um, the Phillips curve didn't work anymore. That was, that was practically an outcome of the stagflation phenomenon. And Helmut Schmidt said um, he liked um, 5% inflation more than 5% unemployment. Because before that period, we had full employment in Germany all the time. And that was a new phenomenon, 5% uh, unemployment. Now, 
uh, cost push is the Keynesian explanation of inflation uh, besides money creation, which then usually follows. Um, right, and, if you don't follow the cost push with uh, money inflation, then um, those those prices are going to end up coming down anyway because people won't be able to pay them, right? Right, right. Yeah. Well, right, if I'll, you... let, I'll let Stefan ask some questions. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Okay. So I wanted to I wanted to go back to a few points. I mean, Jay mentioned that we started reading Kindleberger, right? So the, the I believe that was actually in a so the, the the chapter we read was actually in a book that you edited back in the day. So that's the that's right. Yeah, co that's co edited, right. right? So the, the, there's even more more of a connection here than, than Jay already mentioned. But um, so I'm Kindle sure you, you know, I were friends, by the way. We exchanged a lot of letters and met every time I was in Cambridge. That is very fascinating. So um, I'm sure we can learn a lot by that also on Kindleberger. But so so in, in this chapter, Kindleberger has these three explanations. So I guess my, my first, so um, that Jay already mentioned, right? So um, the monetarist perspective, then balance of payment and structuralist. So do you think that is a complete list? So, um, um, because I'm, I'm not entirely sure about that. So Kindleberger a bit pretends that it's like a complete list of explanations for the um, for the German hyperinflation. But my, my impression also from what you're saying is that there's more to it. Or how do you think about this Kindlebergian list? Well, you could call it um, for the remote causes. Um, the political explanation, which I am trying in my book, you know, uh, I think that uh, the fear of hyperinflation after the financial crisis, um, which was constantly in the press here in Germany, at least, which led to a lot of uh, invitations for talks by myself. You mean um, the 2008 financial crisis now? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, uh, the ghost of hyperinflation was uh, again uh, mentioned in the press and everywhere. People were afraid because the government was going into debt on a big scale, much bigger, by the way, than now during the pandemic. And, um, and uh, public debt uh, in Germany is, uh, uh, what do you call it? Ein rotes Tuch, a red scarf, or what, what the toreros use to tame their bulls. Um, and uh, I have been arguing all along there is no inflationary threat and uh, hyperinflation is totally out of the question um, because what the central banks are doing by expanding the central bank money supply is to compensate for the shrinking money supply by the banking sector. Uh, most of the money supply, M3 or M2 or M1, is not created by the central bank, but uh, traditionally 90% is created by the banking sector. And um, all the central banks did um, is compensate for the falling demand for credit in the banking system. And, uh, and that was a strategy to avoid deflation and not a strategy to create um, potential for inflation. And actually it turned out after 2008 that um, there was no threat of inflation at all. Um, uh, in fact, uh, the inflation rate uh, was and remained very low until let's say this year and we'll see what happens next year yeah 
Well, I, I couldn't agree more. So the German public discourse on, on debt is very muddled. I'm not sure. So if you've, so, so some political science friends of mine just published a paper, which is called Misremembering Weimar, where they mm -hmm. basically do surveys. And so in, in the mind of people today, it was the hyperinflation uh, that led to the rise of the Nazis and not actually the, the, the austerity policies of ruining in the 30s. So. Um, yeah, um, I think so. Yeah, I think it's it's really worth going back to to these phases of um, hyperinflation and of the twenties and thirties also for the generation now, right? So really, you have to. So probably every generation has to think it through again and again for themselves. Um, but coming back to my my question with these three um, of these three mechanisms that Kindleberger described. So I mean, the 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 week before we read your book. We were trying to think through how this structuralist explanation must work, right? And so what Kindleberger says is that, 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 that there were no social, there was no social agreement among different interest groups in post-war Germany um, it, to allocate the burden of uh, repayment of, uh, mm -hmm. of, of, I don't know, uh, the, what happened during the war and the, the reparations. And we're thinking how that that would work, and so so basically there must be negotiation processes among different interest groups, and they cannot agree um, who has to pay for what, more or less, right? And then so everybody individually ra raises their prices, and this ends up in a inflationary spiral. This is how I understood the Kindlebergian explanation. And um, so so is that is that more or less correct? Do you understand it this way too? And can you reconcile this with the empirical stories you were just telling? Because I, I'm not entirely sure how, how well this narrative of Kindleberger works or how, what, what do you think? Well, actually, um, Gerald Feldman in his book on the great inflation has uh, discussed um, this issue quite a bit. And uh, he also thinks that, um, an agreement on who should uh, foot the bill of the war uh, could not be reached. And uh, that destabilized um, uh, the Weimar Republic. Now, on the other hand, uh, before I did so, uh, a few others also did argue <clears throat> uh, had the inflation not been let loose, so to speak, by decontrolling the economy, decontrolling the exchange rate, and uh, uh, the uh, stopped prices, uh, then uh, the Weimar Republic would have been over in the first depression, 1920-21. Uh, because if we would have had unemployment rates early, that early after the war, uh, the Weimar Republic, which was an experiment, could never have survived. So <clears throat> it is on the one hand true that interest groups could agree and uh, there was a lot of opposition also to the ruling parties in the Weimar Republic. Um, but on the other hand, the Weimar Republic was pretty stable until uh, 1930. Uh, during the elections or in the elections of May 1928, on the federal level, on the rice level, uh, the Nazis only got 2.6% of the vote. So <clears throat> it is hard to believe what uh, Lionel Robbins uh, said that Hitler uh, was the foster child of the inflation. No, he was the foster child of deflation, of uh, Brüning's uh, policy. Now, the inflation has been instrumentalized. I mean, the hyperinflation, the traumatic experience for many Germans 
but by later politicians like Brüning, or after the Second World War, by the president of the Bank Deutscher Länder, the forerunner of the Bundesbank, it was instrumentalized. Uh, Germans were, were um, pushed to hate hyperinflation, like by propaganda. And um, this propaganda, which was used by Brüning uh, during his uh, term of office, um, helped to push through these tremendous um, 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 a tremendous austerity measures that he instituted. And after the Second World War, uh, the Bretton Woods system had been established. Um, that means whoever has less inflation than the rest of the world will be able to conquer export markets. And this was a strategy explicitly argued by uh, the president of the Bank Deutscher Länder. His name was uh, Fokker in 1952, when <clears throat> um, interest rate hikes were criticized. And he said, well, the more stability, price stability we create in Germany, the better you will be able to export and will be protected against imports. So the hyperinflation has been kept alive for, let's say, political propaganda purposes. That's a very interesting argument. And so this propaganda doesn't work anymore if Germany is like the leading country in the Eurozone and supposed to uh, keep that uh, arrangement together somehow, right? Well, uh, the Eurozone is a fixed exchange rate system and it works there, of course. And look exactly. at the, huh? yeah, yes, look but, at uh, the uh, balance of payments of Germany, huge increases in true, the- but in the, in, the, in the Bretton Woods system, you have like the US in the center of the system that uh, has uh, sort of the, 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 the responsibility to keep it together. And Germany is a peripheral country that can specialize on this kind of niche strategy. And so this niche strategy cannot work if Germany is one of the central or maybe the central country of the Eurozone. Uh, that is correct. I criticize uh, the German policy for that very much. Yeah. It creates imbalances that threaten the Euro. Yeah. Um, uh, one thing, so coming back to the hyperinflation, so one thing that I find interesting, I wanted to push you a bit on that, you, you mentioned it, um, but but so <clears throat> also trying to understand this Kindlebergian explanation a bit, because so, so I, I'm still a bit undecided what to think of it, right, but that's why I'm interested, and, and but, but so it, it seems to me very important to understand how distorted the price mechanism was during the war, right, so you have uh, prices as signals absolutely no longer functioning, right? They're basically also propaganda to uh, to hide uh, actual scarcity levels, right? So to sustain the war effort, and then you have a very, so, and then then you lose the war, and there's not much government power anymore, right? It's all chaos, and then so this these distorted prices unwind, and the question is, are you able to find a new balance in which prices become a meaningful level again or not. And then if you do not have any kind of centralized uh, authority to, to manage that, and if you have competing interest groups that all hate the outcome of the war, then, th th then this is also like a structural factor th th that can lead to, lead to permanently rising inflation rates. So, so is, is this also a reasonable way of thinking about how this structuralist explanation uh, works? Yes, I would say so. But um, I don't know whether the price control system during the war 
um, and its lifting uh, after the war can be put under structural uh, explanation. Um, okay. Well, when you have uh, fixed uh, prices um, and you let them lose again, there's always inflation in the United States after the Second World War also. Um, there was a recent article by some uh, economist in a Fed, I forgot which Fed, which was arguing that uh, the present situation is uh, a bit like uh, 1946 or 45, 46, when, when uh, the money supply had been expanded also in the United States in the Second World War, but not as much as in Germany in the First World War. And, and, and then uh, price controls were lifted and you had a jump in the inflation rate. Now, he takes that jump as a warning against what might happen after the pandemic, you know, when people are able to return to their old buying patterns, which has not yet uh, happened in Germany. The, um, savings rate has increased tremendously during the pandemic. And um, of course, uh, now that the shops have opened again this week, by the way, um, it will, cash will unload itself on the economy. And of course that will raise prices somewhat, but that's a temporary phenomenon. It's not like, um, lifting con controls on prices that you have been practicing for some years in a war. Okay, then, then I take this to mean that the, that, the, that the explanation that inflation arises from the lifting of price controls is a mechanism that is not covered by the three mechanisms that Kindleberger suggests in his article. Do I get you right there? Well, isn't, uh, isn't say Kindleberger again. saying that, um, you know, there's there's a burden that's being imposed and nobody can decide on how to distribute that burden. So they just kind of, um, they just kind of let it happen. So wouldn't that be compatible with the idea that the price controls are lifted um, and then nobody's deciding who has to pay the higher prices or or who has to have less money or something like that. So so you just get the, the inflation the way they saw it. Are, don't these two things line up with each other a little bit? Uh, yes, um, but <clears throat> the only way uh, that the inflation could have stopped uh, by the German government um, uh, after uh, the effort to stop it by higher taxes failed would have been um, what do you call it in English, Vermögensabgabe a one-time um, tax on wealth, a wealth tax, which had been practiced in Germany in 1913 to uh, finance armaments in preparation of a possible war. Now, the wealth tax uh, would have had to be much greater than the one, what was it, one billion marks uh, in 1913 to compensate for the <clears throat> uh, debt that the government had incurred, uh, much greater. And although many people um, recognized that this would be the only way out of the inflationary spiral, uh, they couldn't agree on such a tax. And it was especially um, uh, opposed by big business. And, um, and of course, by 
the agrarian people also. All those who had not lost um, through the inflation because they were in real goods and not in monetary wealth would have been hit by such a wealth tax. And, um, and the interest groups could agree on that. And the most powerful interest groups were those of big industry uh, and finance was in a neutral position. They were, at least during the inflationary process, suffering from the inflation. So. Can I, can I uh, go into this specific aspect? I think I'm really interested in this just distributional question uh, as well, but you, meant, you pinpointed uh, May 19, 21 after or June 1921 after French disagreed with the Morgan Committee and American capital uh, potential American capital inflows as the turning point to a hyperinflation. Um, in your book, you also mention that the banking system was also used by certain actors to uh, once they recognized that a certain hyper or inflationary spiral was occurring to use the banking system or to, to max out their credit lines to exactly, as you say, buy, uh, go into real assets, use, use that. Could you explain exactly how, how big of a factor that was? Or once we go into this sort of hyperinflationary spiral, it's not completely clear to me what exactly happens. And we just discussed it last week, which was what happens when, the, when money stop, ceases to be a store of value or potentially means of payment. Uh, you know, you start going into barter as well and, and, other, and other forms. Maybe you could explain from your vantage point, what was the process after that particular period? Um, and what, what were, were other accelerators besides the government, uh, the government deficit and monetary finance? Well, the big accelerator of uh, the inflation, even previous to hyperinflation, was the velocity of money, you could say. Um, everybody wanted to get rid of cash uh, as fast as possible because cash would diminish in value while, um, you know, you would buy food uh, the day that wages were paid out. Uh, for the whole week um, to avoid price increases during the rest of the week and so on. But <clears throat> what most people do not realize is that most of the money circulating in Germany during the hyperinflation was stable foreign money like the dollar, like uh, the Dutch Gilda, like uh, the British Pound. Um, and uh, this uh, tended to be much more uh, than in amount than uh, the mark currency that was circulating. So if you could use uh, your wage payment or salary payment, uh, and buy food for it immediately. And the other half, uh, you would be able to turn into stable uh, money from abroad. Uh, then you could protect yourself against uh, inflation. And many people did that. The amount of uh, currency, foreign currency circulating in Germany or being kept as a store of value also uh, was much higher than the mark currency. So that was one. I think that's a very once again, and that this. was a driver of the inflation because the less people were paying um, or were using 
uh, mark currency in transactions, the less would be the amount of inflation tax. You know, inflation is a tax on money holders. But if uh, the number of, of money holders in marks goes down, then the inflation tax uh, yields less and less to the government. That's finally what ended uh, the hyperinflation in the summer of 19, 1920 or started efforts to stabilize the German currency in uh, uh, starting in August 1923 and finally uh, put through in November 1923. So the idea is, is kind of that nobody's using the mark anymore at that point, um, or, or most people are using these other currencies. Um, and then, so then there's no real, nobody cares politically about stabilizing the old mark anymore. And then you can just kind of get rid of it at that point. Is that, is that kind of, kind of what happened? Um, well, um, I would say there were uh, factions in German society that wanted uh, the mark or the hyperinflation to end because it didn't make sense anymore, neither for the government, the inflation tax uh, didn't yield any real amounts anymore, neither for agriculture, whose prices, and that agriculture was more than 25% of the German economy, whose prices were still controlled, and they wanted those prices decontrolled, um, nor for um, big business, um, they did their international trade uh, in dollar and other foreign currencies. They had stopped using the mark. So um, but they wanted to be um, integrated into the world economy with a, let's say, a domestic German mark for a big country like Germany to do business in a foreign currency only uh, is sort of an end to sovereignty. And they didn't want that. May I, may I ask you, so I've been working a bit on, on like um, offshore dollars today. So I find this all very fascinating that you, that you stress the importance of uh, the dollar at the time because I hadn't heard, really, or I hadn't thought this through, but so what type of dollar instruments were used at the time? Was it really dollar banknotes that had been printed in the US and then kind of shipped into Germany? Or was there like dollar creation by banks in Germany going on, what we witness today very much? And did the dollarization happen after the war or already during the war? No, not during the war. This so it's all, all post-war. Yeah, this all during the war, possibly with neighboring countries like Dutch uh, people, neutral countries or Switzerland. Um, but um, the dollarization took place after the war. Um, and it was partly in terms of uh, dollar bills. Um, mind you, there for a while, there were American troops in Germany stationed along the Rhine. And um, and uh, the dollar was a very strong country compared to the mark. So um, they could buy lots of things uh, at cheap prices in Germany and the dollar bills remained in Germany and were used by small scale households, you know, uh, the wage earner also uh, to um, have a store of value or to pay for goods in dollars uh, 
which meant stable prices in dollars, more or less. Many businessmen um, offered their goods in dollar prices and according to the exchange rate, they would take German money or they would be paid in dollar bills. That would be then okay. Now the big scale was the banks where you could uh, keep um, accounts in US dollar or British pounds or Dutch guilders. That was all possible. And, um, but you know, during this year and a half long phase when the exchange rate was relatively stable, um, for example, iron ore exporters in Spain to German big industry, iron industry, uh, kept the proceeds uh, willingly in uh, mark accounts with German banks because they expected the exchange rate would be going up again. Um, but, uh, but the shift uh, from uh, mark accounts of big business or businessmen in general uh, from mark accounts into foreign exchange accounts uh, started to take place uh, by German business after the May ultimatum uh, 1921. And that gave it a first inflationary push. And um, the Morgan Committee, when it did not succeed to mobilize long-term capital for Germany, uh, then uh, shattered the positive expectations of uh, foreign, foreigners who had invested in German mark. And they shifted it or took it out and thereby launched the hyperinflationary process. Um, and so you mentioned it was the dollar, it was the pound, it was the Dutch guilder. I mean, the so as Kindleburgians, we would assume that at this point it was still like a more of a sterling system, right? Because the shift from the UK to the US as global hegemon hadn't really taken place. So, so was there a so my, my prediction then would be that that the, that the pound was maybe even more important than the dollar, or is that not true? Do you have a hunch about this, like in terms of offshore use of? currencies in post-war Germany? Well, actually, um, I don't have the exact figures, or maybe I have them in my book, but I can't recall them right now. Uh, I think that the dollar was more important, yes. Because the dollar at the time was the only currency on the gold standard. The British... Mm -hmm didn't return until 1925. And that was uh, what made the American position so powerful. That's very interesting. So, um, and, but, 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 okay, no, I'm just wondering. So I was, so how many troops, so, so one hypothesis could also be that uh, if you get conquered by one country and there are these troops, they bring their money and this obviously leads to inflows. But, but I mean, World War I, Germany was not conquered in the same sense as World War II, Germany was conquered, right? So, I mean, it, it's not that, that foreign troops were stationed everywhere after 1919 or were they? I mean, no, that is true. Sure. They were stationed left of the Rhine. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, the Americans were in the area, if I recall, um, uh, Mainz, Wiesbaden, that kind of area. Um, I, I would have another question that shifts a bit further, unless we still have more of this. Yeah, and on this on this quick issue, just I was just wondering. So these these dollar accounts or these foreign accounts in the banking system. Um, they were 
I mean, there's a lot of questions. They're all private accounts, of course. They're in private banks, private promise to pay. Uh, there yeah. was no credit. There was no credit element here, though, right? The bank banking system could not take dollar deposits and and sort of do fractional reserve on on those potentially, right? There was there, there was uh, there was none of that. That was my, that's my first question. But my real question is, what is the what is the Reichsbank's position on that? Because obviously, when there's now dollar deposit or foreign currency deposits in your own banking system, you have lost control over a portion of your money supply in that as well. And the obvious sort of modern answer is, okay, I'm going to talk to the Fed and establish swap lines potentially, or some sort of some sort of way of, of acquiring the demanded currency into my, into my system. Um, so I'm wondering if any, how the Reichsbank was, was dealing with specific the specific issue of foreign accounts starting to be offered in, in the private banking system? As far as I know, the Rice Bank didn't um, uh, steer uh, the foreign exchange accounts. Um, the private banks who had committed themselves to Germans in, let's say, US dollar, um, had to secure this debt by placing the equivalent amount into a US bank and or getting a credit from a US bank for this eventuality that uh, the customer would uh, withdraw uh, from the German private bank. The Rice Bank was not involved in that. As far as I know, that's super interesting. Uh, I'll leave it with Stefan next. But is there any sort of account of this that I mentioned anywhere uh, in in your book? We might have missed it, or anywhere else of these particular developments. Um, is there something in my book? I would have to look it up. <laughs> um, uh, but I guess there's, we, uh, there's to... another book which specializes more on the behavior of banks during the inflation, uh, which is, uh, what's the title? Uh, let me get it. I have it here. Yeah. So we have a little over 10 minutes left, so we should all come to our final questions, but I think we should maybe plan to invite him to talk about Kindleberg and his personal relationship at some point. I'm pretty intrigued about that too. So which, which points do still matter? So I would still like to ask a bit about these Darlehens Kassenscheine, which I find very fascinating. Um, yeah, maybe we could Yeah, I think that's fine. Is there anything, Alex, you want to bring up? I feel like I've asked, I, I have a lot of questions I could ask, but I feel like I've asked the big ones that I wanted to ask. Let me yeah. answer uh, Jay's question. Here's the book, Joint Stock Banking in Germany by P. Barrett Whale, W-H-A-L-E. A study of the German credit banks before and after the war. It's a very good book. It's old. Let's see. All this is good in my opinion. 68. We'll, we, we'll, we'll so dig much. it out. Um, so <clears throat> one question that I'm dying to ask is also about uh, the Darlehens Kassenscheine. So I, I find this very fascinating. So I have recently published a paper on the Eurozone fiscal system, how it develops and so how they they set up all sorts of, I call them off balance sheet fiscal agencies, right? So sub balance sheets, that are not part of the main treasury that have more elasticity space that can issue all sorts of new instruments. And so my, my claim for, the, for the, how the Eurozone transforms is that because you can't really deal with that um, because it's all, all so, so stuck, um, what, what you do or what works is setting up new balance sheets and putting all the activity there. So you can really trace that for the last, last 10 years, how more and more of these off balance sheet fiscal vehicle uh, agencies pop up now the re recovery and, uh, and resilience facility. So 
and but but so so this has a history right and so one thing is that it really starts during world war one and to me these german dalians cousin china are or dalians cousin right they are basically these off balance sheet fiscal agencies for the state and they can create new instruments you even write that they're basically like money but then um uh, yeah, somehow in, in an intermediate position, right? So I mean, you compare them a bit to the to the um, greenbacks of the of the U.S. Treasury, or at least some other instruments, maybe rather that are directly issued by the Treasury. Um, and what I learned from your book is that that the plans actually existed since oh no, I mean, maybe I read that in Kindleberger, but the, the plans for this existed basically since the late nineteenth century, right? So. That's right. It was, yes. it was basically an, an idea that had existed and then they kind of found it somewhere in the shelves because they really needed to create some purchasing power for the war. They were not felt well prepared and then ended up uh, going with this. And I mean, the statistics that you have, they show a, a rapid expansion of, um, of these Dalian's cousin. Right. That's correct. That is um, correct. <clears throat> And so, it uh, was, yeah. they uh, had already existed in the 19th century in connection with the uh, liberation of, uh, what do you call them, Bauern, farmers in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, and they needed credit uh, to invest in their agriculture. And uh, for those, Darlin's custom were created. So there was a tradition in Germany. And it was Lombard credit, not discount credit, but Lombard credit that the Darlin's custom practiced. And they would give out Darlin's custom scheine, which in turn were taken in by the rice bank as cover of the money supply. So it was a gimmick to be able to increase the money supply. I mean, so, so I mean, they're a bit like also the precedents to the MEFO bills, maybe the ones that Jay is so interested in, right? So what, what then Schacht did like just uh, 15 years later or so to-, to Right. To, um, um, so, so what what is your stance on on their role for the hyperinflation? So, was that what, was that something that was inherently inflationary, or um, uh, of the of the Darlene's cast in China? So, how how do you con how do you connect that to all the the hyperinflation developments? Well, <clears throat> uh, it didn't have much to do with hyperinflation. It uh, did have some to do with inflation during the First World War. But actually, there were other drivers of hyperinflation in 1922-23. Hyperinflation sets in in July 1922, after the Morgan Com Committee had, had refused to recommend um, capital, long-term capital exports to Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and at that point, um, when the exchange rate was going down the drain and prices in Germany would uh, go up on a big scale, uh, the Reichsbank Bank decided not only to discount Darlin's Kassenscheine, but also and discount Darlin's Kassenscheine and uh, uh, public uh, bills of debenture, uh, Reichskassenscheine, but it also discounted bills of exchange um, of private business starting in that phase, uh, July. 1922. And that was expanded the money supply on a much bigger scale than the Darlin's Kassen China. And that created the money supply necessary to let the uh, hyperinflation run its course. So what's your assessment of this Darlin's Kassen China policy? Was it a like, uh, you know, is it a, is it a useful policy? Um, 
uh, also outside I of war finance context maybe uh, yes in that case i think that you know businessmen especially and farmers uh, could go to the dalis gasse and um, uh, against the lombard of land or or some real good uh, for example the harvest uh, they could take out a credit and uh, and that was at a fixed uh, interest rate interest rates were practically not raised during the war and for a long time also not after the war until hyperinflation began I think it was kept at 6%. In any case, um, they could take out credit at a time when the prices for their product, especially in agriculture, were controlled. Um, there were maximum prices for wheat, potatoes, all kinds of uh, food stuff. And, um, and uh, of course, wages were also kept down, but there was a shortage of labor and because of the draft and, and all that. Uh, but in any case, um, uh, even though the balance sheet of a farmer might not look very good for a bank, they could go to the Darlingskasse and take out the credit. And in that sense, it kept production going. And I think it was beneficial, although <clears throat> um, it, it, the problems were postponed practically through Darlene's cousin. If they had not existed, many more business, businesses would have come into difficulties. And uh, this uh, was uh, prevented or postponed until after the war. Um, and what happened with these Dalianskassenscheine after the war? Did they then disappear or was it continued? Did they, did they lose value? Were they also inflated away, away in value? Uh, of course they lost value because they were put out in nominal mark. Mm -hmm. And uh, practically, they dwindled away in real terms, just like any monetary value in the hyperinflation. No? So um, okay, but they, they they continue to exist at least for a little bit after the war. Before the um, okay, we, we said there were different yes, phases yes, of they did. Inflation, yeah. but yeah, okay, yeah. But then, I've but then with the with the hyperinflation, or so after the hyperinflation, they also didn't come back, probably, probably, right? So they no, kind of, no. The, no, the hyperinflation also eradicated them. Uh, that's right. Yeah, hyperinflation okay. eradicated them totally, um, and there was um, the revaluation movement of debts that had been um, evaporated by the hyperinflation in nineteen twenty four twenty five. There was some legislation and different sorts of debt, for example, mortgages, were revalued uh, the most, if I recall exactly, to a value of 10%. Um, so the debtors were not completely free, although they had wiped out their debt in hyper, during hyperinflation by worthless money. Um, but for government debt, the revaluation rate was by far the lowest. If I recall, it's in my book, 2% or less. Um, and the government freed itself more than any other institution of uh, pre-war or wartime debt or post-war debt. So, I mean, uh, what do you then think about this hypothesis that the government really wanted it 
uh, or it was uh, or has it sagen wir, billigend in Kauf genommen or so so how how should we how should we think about the relationship of the government to the hyperinflation so sometimes sometimes you hear that that it was like really a thing on purpose that they created um, I don't know so how do you think about it well uh, actually the government did have the biggest stake in uh, reducing or evaporating public debt. Uh, of course, private debt was likewise uh, reduced, um, but the government had this interest to become debt-free and start anew like they did practically in 1924. But there were other motives involved. And one motive was uh, the reconquest of world markets by dumping the exchange rate. Dumping the exchange rate was the only way to overcome trade barriers abroad. And, um, and it also played a role in uh, the uh, Fortney Macumba tariff in the United States in the early 1920s. Uh, in hearings in the Congress, there was a lot of talk of dumping prices uh, by German exporters to justify the increase in American tariffs. Um, that was the second motive. Uh, a very important one. Um, and um, it is amazing that uh, the French uh, more or less did let the Germans act as they did by freeing exchange rates and prices. Uh, and by uh, importing less from France than uh, the French would have liked to export to Germany. French exports mainly consisted of luxury items like champagne, like uh, perfumes uh, or other uh, luxury items. And um, the Germans, of course, always argued we don't, we control, there was a huge control system for every export and import during the inflation, which I didn't treat much in my book, but I have treated it in my contribution to the history of the uh, Reichswirtschaftsministerium, which came out in 2015. Um, there was a huge control apparatus and um, the Germans uh, hindered French products to be imported. And the French swallowed that because the Germans argued if we import champagne and perfumes and all that luxury stuff, um, we have less money to pay reparations. So, the French did let the Germans act uh, in that way, which is astounding. Uh, in the end, I mean, <laughs> reparations didn't come through anyway, only after the Dawes plan when capital imports were again possible on a long-term basis, then the French really got some reparation, but it was reduced, like the Morgan Committee had already tried to. The Dawes Committee finally um, caught the French uh, in a time of weakness, like Stephen Schucker has argued, the end of French predominance in Europe. And he analyzes that uh, French weakness in 1924. <clears throat> and uh, yes, um, I think that uh, that the government had an interest in 
keeping the inflation going as long as uh, the inflation tax, so to speak, that flowed to the government was mostly borne by foreigners and um, did yield enough to uh, finance the government and stabilize as much as possible uh, the currency. But that was over practically after when a hyperinflation set in. And maybe a final question, but so, so you think it could have been stopped earlier um, had they wanted to? And what exactly, so I, I, I have never fully understood, what exactly was the, was, what was the genius aspect of the Skenton mark that, that Schacht implemented, which is said to have stopped it? You mean uh, the metho bills? No, 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 no. How so? So isn't it? Isn't is Schacht has been credited for end, ending the hyperinflation during the Weimar Republic, isn't it? Yeah, he and some other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, what exactly was it that ended it? Well, actually, the introduction of a new currency, the Rentenmark. Yeah. And. Um, and of the scarce issue of the renton mark by the renton bank, which was set beside the Reich Bank as a second central bank, so to speak, um, of the issue of the renton mark, the government institutions were granted a certain share, and the rest, let's say. Half, I don't have it in my mind now, half was allotted to government institution and the other half to private business. And, um, and uh, the Schacht uh, became president of the uh, Reichsbank, um, the successor of Hafenstein. And when the demand for more issue of currency came from the side of government and from the side of business. Uh, in April 1924, he refused. And uh, so uh, the currency was kept uh, scarce. And that was the trick. Had he granted more liquidity, to uh, government and business uh, that could have started another inflationary process. And then of course, in uh, later in 1924, the Dawes plan and the Dawes loan and the return of the German currency to a sort of gold standard prompted uh, private capital inflows. And that also stabilized uh, uh, the mark, which uh, the Renton mark was then uh, transformed after the DOS plan or when the DOS plan was implemented into the rice mark. It kept circulating besides the rice mark, <clears throat> uh, but uh, the rice mark was also a sort of new currency with a new name. So would it be accurate to say that because the Renton mark was a new currency, um, it didn't come with uh, all of the political baggage, all of the political constraints um, that were kind of forcing uh, the original German mark into hyperinflation. Uh, and then when the, uh, when the politics tried to intervene, they pushed back against it. So you had kind of this, this fresh start and they were able to, to kind of say no to people. Is that kind of how you think about it? Or, or maybe yeah. the, way I, the way I was explaining it last week or the way I, I remembered it is, was the psychology of having both, both currencies still in circulation and the fact that you had a choice between a scarce, yes. something that has store value and all the properties of money and something that right. was hyperinflation. But, but I think Schacht or the, those who designed it deliberately kept both 
currencies in circulation at the same time, correct? That's right, yeah, that's right. Um, well, actually, when the rice mark was then introduced, uh, the mark was taken out of circulation, but not the Renton mark. Uh, the Renton mark was then no longer uh, administered by the Renton Bank. It was uh, oh, practically running side by side with the rice mark, but it, the Renton Bank like the Darlins cousin had also already already existed in the 19th century and had a very good reputation because they played again uh, this role in the liberation of in the privatization so to speak of uh, land in Prussia and um, and uh, Although they put out a lot of credit, uh, it never became inflationary. So there was a tradition for the Rentenbank uh, and a psychological basis for believing in the stability of the Rentenmark. Yeah, but this is, as we had before, it's basically just propaganda, right? Right. So it, right. it, 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 didn't, it didn't really matter that it was tied to anything. It was just uh, the psychological effect. Yes, but uh, you know, most of banking policy is based on psychology. I agree. Yeah. 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 And, Sch and Schacht, and Schacht uh, also makes that that point. He does talk talk about psychology as being the key thing. Not he never mentions in any of his accounts that the the direct linkage to some arbitrary land that you don't have direct access to. Yeah. We are uh, over time, and I can safely say that I'm completely uh, with so many fresh ideas and perspectives on something I've been curious about my entire life. And now uh, I feel like I want to go in even deeper. But th maybe this also calls for us to continue the conversation in some way. And I would like to just for now thank you, Kalut. I think perhaps. We should invite you on a, ne a number of different issues that you've raised. Number one, Kindleberger potentially, because your personal relationship to Kindleberger is extremely interesting to us. Perhaps we could have another conversation about that in the future. But many of the other issues right here, uh, I'm personally very interested in to continuing the conversation potentially down the road. Um, so unfortunately, that's the time we have today. Um, but if if you would like to say a final thing for this conversation, I would be I'd, be happy to see, hear your final thoughts on today's today's conversation we've just had. There is no threat of another hyperinflation unless there is a big war. Famous last words, and we'll we all subscribe to that. I think too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jay, and the Thank others. You so much. Bye bye. 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 Talk to you soon. Bye bye. Bye.